for sale. These are candy corn M&Ms. And I'm sure they're no good. <laughs> Bill Austin, just so you know, Bill Austin is like my, he, he figures out everything that's new. He sends me pictures of all the new Oreos. <laughs> he sends me, Kenny said you weren't going to be here. And Kenny's your brother's keeper. <laughs> Kenny was wrong. First time ever. First time ever. Right, Amber? <laughs> Bill Austin has this gift of knowing what's new. So there's three new M&Ms, candy corn, pumpkin pie, and cookies and scream. I just figured we'd get the spiritual things out of the way first. And <laughs> we're glad you're here. Glad you're with us. We're going to pray. Pray with me, would you please? Our Father, we came today because you're the reason for everything. And the fact that we show up in your house, that's not a big deal. The big deal is that you would come to earth and die for us. The big deal is that you would say, I'll take their sin, I'll suffer their hell, so that they can be with me forever. If they believe that what I did is exactly what God wants. If there's anybody here today, Lord, that's never trusted Christ, if there's anybody here today that's never asked Jesus to be their Savior, they need to do that today, God, and you're the one that can best show that to them. I pray that they'll see it in us. I pray that they'll sense it in us. I pray that it will be easy for them to tell that they're in church. Lord, work today. Answer prayer. Thank you for answering prayer. There's more prayer, God, that we need answered, and that's why we pray and we come to you. We just beg you, God, to work. Thank you for this day. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Page 327, Springs of Living Water, 327. just trying to tell you the truth. This article was in the paper this week. I'm not quite sure. I can trace it, but I just want to read the article to you and you can think about it. 
It says implanted microchip to replace credit cards and car keys. A microchip embedded under the skin will replace credit cards and keys. They're doing it in Sweden. The Swedes are able to have their embedded chip scanned by a conductor of a train who uses an app to match up their chip membership number with a purchase ticket. Around 3,000 people in Sweden have already had a chip embedded in their hand in order to access secure areas of buildings. There's a company in Sweden, um, I'm not sure of all this, some of it's abbreviated and I think they're assuming we know, I don't. But it says that they have a company that is developing and making and they're not concerned about privacy. It says when the program was launched, some customers complained that they were passing out information because of that chip. It says you could use the microchip implant to replace a lot of stuff, your credit card, the key, your credit cards, the keys to your house, keys to your car. Oh, they said that they started microchipping children last year and that Americans will eventually accept the process as something just as normal as the barcode. How many of you remember going to the grocery store? When I, in the 70s, I was one of the guys at Martin's that put the food on the shelves, and we had one of those stampers. You'd set the number and you had to stamp every can or every box, and then the lady, they got paid a lot of money because they had to do all the work. Now they go, <laughs> but they used to have, a, have to put all everything in. And we thought, man, is that amazing. With a barcode, everything's there. Inventory, price. It says that it's not a matter of if it will happen, but when. Concerns about, we know it's going to happen. Concerns about the embedded microchip representing the mark of the beast mentioned in the Bible have been expressed by many on the Christian right. <laughs> I want you to know where I'm at. And it talks in Revelation 13, verse 16 and 17 about every man receiving a mark in the right hand or in their forehead. And that, it's here. It's here. Someone says, do you think the Lord's coming soon? And you know my response. I think he's late. It looks like he's past due. With everything that's going on, you say, now, pastor, I know, I know. He'll be right on time. But sometimes, doesn't it seem like, wow, I can't believe he's putting up with all this? Yeah. We're glad you're here. If you have a bulletin, we'd like you to grab that. There are a couple of things we want to add to that so you know what's happening. Remind me before I'm done. Let me get my thing done. John Sheets then. Isn't it good to see John Sheets? He was just in the hospital Friday. Friday? Did you get up Friday? Saturday. Saturday? Yesterday? And he came to church today. And in the choir. And in the choir. Give him a hand. Give him a candy bar. 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 Give Choir at five, yeah. choir at five if you're in the choir, evening service at six. This Tuesday, well, I'm, I'm debating this. Yeah, let, let's, Tuesday the 19th, there's a ladies work day to clean the parsonage. The parsonage is empty, it needs it needs a lot of work, and there's some real concerns and issues over there that we need to address. But see my wife, 10 a.m., they're going to meet at the parsonage, and the ladies are going to just get it spiffed up. They were going to do it for the fishing trip, but we're not doing that. But there's still some things they can do over there. And you see my wife. Is she down in, is she here? No. See her, she's downstairs. If, if, uh. She'll let you know, but plan on that if you can. Tuesday, 10 o'clock, meet at the parsonage. If you come, let her know. If you can't come that day, it says that she'll set up another time. She can meet you there. She and others have been over there doing some work, trying to get that uh, 
just ready for, I don't know, maybe she's moving me in there. I don't. <laughs> Tomorrow, jail service for the men, 8.30. Wednesday, midweek service, King's Kids Youth Group. Thursday, ladies' birthday lunch. That is at Angelo's. That's noon on Thursday. Several things in the future, September the 24th. There's a, at 2.30, a service, Mil, Milgram, Milgram, Miller's Mary Manor. Milgram is Pilgrim and Miller's. At Miller's, no, the 24th, 2.30, Miller's Mary Manor, New Carlisle. Fred has that service. If you'd like to be a part of that, see him. That's the 24th. 25th is a Monday. That's a jail service. Uh, is that two weeks from tomorrow? A week from tomorrow? A week from tomorrow. So there's one tomorrow and then one in a week. And then there is a note about the men's fishing outing. And John Sheets will come forward and give you info on that. We want to let you know, if you've been a part of this, one of the missionaries we support is Chaplain Carl Ross with Forgotten Man Ministries up in Michigan. And he's doing a fantastic job. Roger is actually, Roger Pendle's actually one of the chaplains. And they have a big dinner every year. And if you would like to be a part of this dinner, the dinner is Thursday, October 5th. The dinner is actually at 6.30. They have a fellowship at 6. But it's a wonderful meal. Inmates give testimonies. They have a preacher. If you're available, you it, it's free. It's free. The church or whoever will cover the cost of the table. But if you can go to that, if you want to go and you have a number, if you say, I'm going or my wife and I would like to go, We'll get you a ride there if you need. We'll try to take a, a double up. But it is Thursday, October 5th, and we'll leave at maybe about 5 o'clock. I'm not sure. If you can go or would like to go on your own, we can get you details. But if you can go, we need a number. Would you let Lucy, can they let you know? Let Lucy know. Raise, look at Lucy. Raise your hand. Higher. Higher. <laughs> Lucy is having surgery Wednesday. She has skin cancer on her lip, and they're going to try to get it off. So would you pray for her 930 Wednesday morning? If you're going to go, if you're going to go to the dinner, though, would you please, please let us know, let her know, let Lucy know. One more thing. You all call him Steve. I call him Stephen because he's my son. I always have. When you're not, I call him Steve because I'm lazy. But Steve Ruley is leaving Friday to go to Ecuador again. Amen. Amen. So if you would pray for him, he will be gone this Friday, the 22nd, until the next following Sunday, son, the 1st which is the first, October 1st. So same, if you're not familiar with that, you can ask him. I don't know what he needs. I'm going to let you ask him. He's, everything's been covered, though. God showed him he wanted him to go, so he's going again. And uh, we'll, we don't want him to go, and Christy's anxious for him to go, but we, <laughs> he's not as bad as his dad. But uh, again, training the nationals over there, law enforcement, Studying the Bible with them, there's always somebody saved. So if you would pray real hard about that for their safety as they leave Friday, early Friday, and then pray for that whole week as they train uh, the Ecuadorians and they preach to them and study the Bible and lead them to Christ. And I mean higher ups, not just some cops. I mean, these are guys that protect the president of the country and it, it's quite it's quite exciting so if you would just pray do that please if you there's a note there if, if you've seen it if you haven't I'll read it to make sure you're aware but if you'd like to provide snacks for King's kids sign the sheet posted on the bulletin board or you could see Lynn Pendle if you have any questions about that John Sheets is going to come wants to talk about the men's fishing trip You don't have to stand up. Or, uh, I honor you. I honor you. Okay, the, uh, there's been some changes 
there's some issues with the parsonage that I don't think the men are going to use it. Uh, you need the main thing I need. We're going to have a meeting tonight after church, and if you're going to go even for a day, I need to know. And I'll be thinking about what day or two, whenever you can go, so we can know how to plan for boats. We need to know how many guys we're going to have each day of the week, so we know how many boats we're going to need. And if you can't make the meeting tonight, and want to come for a day or more, see me today before you leave. It's important that I know how many are going to come for a day, two days, three days, whatever. Okay? But we're going to discuss the issues, decide what we're going to do about some things tonight at the meeting, right after church, downstairs, where we always meet. Thank you. Amen. He sounds better already. How much fluid did they take? Over three? How many? Three and a half liters. Three and a half liters of fluid outside of his lungs. Three times. I have a, a needle up here. It was kind of kind of like that. And they jammed it into his back. And then sucked out all the fluid. I knew you'd want to hear that because you're thinking about lunch. So I want to get your mind off lunch. If you're visiting, we're glad you're here. The ushers are coming. Pray for John. He sounds better already. I think he's already getting back his air and his wind and able to function better. So we're glad about that. If you, somebody you don't see, they might be on vacation. So they're running. I know the palings were going to Florida, but that changed. So they went to Colorado. That's almost as good. Pray with me. Father, thank you for the day. Thank you for meeting our needs. Thank you for loving us when the Bible says we were yet sinners. Thank you for showing us love and sending Jesus. Work and speak today, please. Thank you for how you take care of us. Thank you for showing us how to trust. Lord, we don't always like that, but when we look back on it, we know that that's the greatest lesson besides being saved that we've learned. Thank you for what you're doing in John Sheets' life. Thank you for the safety you gave George Newton all the way to California and back. And God, now just be with those who aren't here today. They're different places, uh, some up north, some out west. Just give them safety as they travel. And Lord, make this day uh, a great day for us. Speak to us. Challenge us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
and next Sunday we're going to begin our cantata practice for Amen. this year. So this is a, a, a plea, I guess you might say. For those of you who are not in the choir, and you want to be in the choir, come and join us. We, we'd love to have you, except for Doug. He can't sing. Doug, you cannot come. No, even you're welcome. So if you want to be in the choir and you have a desire to sing, use your voice for the Lord, come see us. All right, 340 in your hymnals, barely, barely, page 340. Let's all stand, shall we? On the first verse, Junior Church and Primary Church, you may be dismissed. Romans chapter 12, Romans chapter 12. Romans 
Romans chapter 12. If you have a Bible, that will be great. That's what we do. We use the Bible. If you don't, you can look on, you can listen, you can, uh, you have it on your phone or your pad or wherever you have it, get it out. Power's in the Bible, power's not in me. Right. Amen. Romans chapter 12, Romans chapter 12. I, I don't know, a lot of times, look, most of the time I don't know what I'm doing. And I don't know what I'm doing today. But for some reason, I, I'm supposed to preach this message. And I don't ask why. Amen. I just do it. So maybe it's for me, maybe it's for you, maybe it's for tomorrow. I don't know. Romans chapter 12. We'll read it and then I'll tell you what we're going to talk about. You'll get it as we read it. Romans chapter 12. The Bible is to help you. It's not to make you smarter. It's to help you. Some of you are smart enough. You need to start living what you know. Amen. Because if you're not living it, then you're wasting it. So you need to live it. It needs to be working your life. And you say, I don't know why the Lord would do that, why he would allow that, why he would break, because he's trying to get you to live what he said to you. He doesn't just want you to quote it. I don't really care for those people that know all the answers. I want someone who's been through it. Every time the doctor wants to hurt me or the dentist, I always say, have you ever been through this? <laughs> and you know what they usually say? No. I had an eardrum that was bad. They wanted to put a tube in it. So the doctor said, I need to stick that eardrum with a needle and numb it. So I could poke a hole in. I'm not going to put you under. Just going to numb your eardrum. So the poke will hurt, but then it will numb up. I can slit it, put a tube in. I said, hold on. Have you ever had this? He said, well, no. I said, then you don't know what I'm supposed to do. He said, well, I would grab that table. I was laying on a table. He said, I would grab that table. So I grabbed the table. He said, hold on. I thought, boy, I shouldn't be paying anything for this. <laughs> he hit my eardrum with that needle, and my eardrum was so infected and bad that it wouldn't go in. So he said, hold on. Man, I was gripping that. He, and pretty soon when he jabbed that eardrum a couple times with that needle, he said, let go. You're going to pass out. Because I had a grip on that table, man. If you've never had that, I can't explain the pain to you. Jesus didn't put you here so you could tell everybody what you think. Jesus put you and I here to tell everybody what we've been through. Amen. Romans chapter 12, verse 14. Bless them. Watch this now. You don't mind the bless. But who are you supposed to bless? It says, verse 14, bless them with persecute you. What? Bless them. Wait a minute. Are you telling me the Bible says when someone goes after me, when they talk me down or talk bad about me or treat me bad, I'm supposed to bless them. I didn't come up with that. I didn't say that. The Bible did. See why I didn't want to preach this? I'd rather curse than bless. You say, well, man, that's horrible. Yeah, but he says, bless them with, per with persecute you, bless and curse not. Think about it. When someone comes after you, when you go through a hard time, when you don't like something that's happening to you, when someone treats you bad, you want to get back at them. The Bible says, the Bible says, boy, it's one thing to know this. One thing to quote it. It's another thing to go through it and have to practice it. Amen. You say, well, couldn't the Lord just keep everybody that wants to persecute me away? I'm still around. I'll persecute you. Verse 14 again, bless them. Got that? Bless them which persecute. Bless them. God bless you. 
God be praised. I hope God does his best for you. You say, wait a minute, I could never do that. Then you're not saved. Then you don't have the love of God. You don't have the new nature from God in you if you can't do that. He didn't say don't struggle with it, but if you can't do it, something's wrong with you. Something's missing. Something's missing. Verse 15. Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not, verse 16, mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Verse 17, recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, I'm glad he put that there. You know the problem with that, though? When I think I know what's possible, the Lord always reminds me that with God, all things are possible. But God goes, look, if they don't cooperate, if it be possible on your side, do it. Verse 18, it would be possible as much as lieth in you. Live peaceably with all men. Now there are some guys who don't want to talk to me. There are some people who don't want to talk to me. They don't like something I've done. They don't like a stand, something I've stood for. They don't have the option of whether or not I am peaceable towards them. Verse 14. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. So if someone chooses to persecute me, they do not have the option of how I treat them. As a Christian, I'm supposed to bless them. As a Christian, verse 18, I am supposed to be as peaceable to them as I can. You say, I don't like that. Me neither. But that's what Christians do. That's what sets us apart. Verse 19. He says, dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place under wrath. I'm going to ask you a very personal question. God ain't going to send you to hell over this. Scott, turn this camera off. Don't put this camera on the people. We don't want, we're going to see some hands. Shoot the one down the middle so we don't get many hands. How many of you have ever gotten mad? That's the easy part. Hard part's not getting mad. He says to us there, Give place, rather give place. There's a place for it. There's a time. He said God has already written. This is Deuteronomy 32, 35. First time he said it. You know it in the New Testament, but he instituted it in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 32, 35. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Verse 20. Here's where it gets more ugly. Ready? Some of you want to just pray and go home. Here's what he says, verse 20. Therefore, if thine enemy, who? Enemy. Who? Enemy. If thine enemy hunger, what are you supposed to do? Feed him. How many of you have ever been hungry? I don't care what camera's on. How many of you have ever been hungry? If thine enemy be hungry, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, watch now, for in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Don't look at the last verse. Don't look up, look up, look up, look up. I'm coming out there. Look up. 
It is unnatural for me to act like Christ. But it's natural for my new nature to be like Christ. But I have Galatians 5, this battle, this war that wars in me. And too often I give in to the old nature. When something's hard, when someone persecutes me, if I have an enemy, there's something in me that says, I, I'm just not going to fuss with it. I'm not going to go through all the trouble of blessing them, feeding them, giving them water, waiting for God to get vengeance. I'll help God with the vengeance. That's what the old man says. But the new man gives me this capacity. The new man, the new nature, the divine nature, the being born again. Isn't it wonderful that a person could be born again? I don't know about you, but even up to my 18 years when I was saved, my old nature, my old man, the only man I had, got me in a lot of trouble. So when I got born again, I got a chance again. And I don't want to blow it. So he tells me at the end of the chapter, verse 21, he says, be not overcome of evil. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with, say it, good. overcome evil with good. good. You're going to leave here bruised and battered, but you're going to be a better person. Pray with me. Our Father, there is so much that we fail in. And thank you for dying for failure. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that even though you live in us and we fail, you never leave. You said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Help us today to bless and curse not. Help us to live a life that sets us apart from the rest of the world. It could be someone in our own family. God, there are people in the same house, the same family, that struggle to get along. Same room. Dear God, help today, I pray, if that be true. Help us. Help us to bless and curse not. Help us to be not overcome with evil, but to overcome evil with good. I need your help. You know I do. I'm asking for it. I am begging and pleading for your help. I'm asking Holy Spirit for your power. That which needs to be communicated can only be done by you. I'll be your voice. I'll be your messenger. But you, please, please, God, communicate this message to every one of us. And whether we're sitting in another room or even in our living room, if someone's watching this Wherever they are, God speak to who's ever hearing this. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. What makes us different than those who aren't Christian? Well, we go to church. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the way we act when we're not in church. Work. Talking about those times, not those times when everything is out. I'm not talking about the time that you go to the restaurant and they say uh, the place is packed and you go, there's 24 of us. And they go, we'll seat you right away. Before you sit down, they've got water. The next minute, the waitress comes over, takes all your order, gets them all correct. The food's out in two and a half minutes. They give you free dessert for being cute. They tell you somebody else has paid your bill. I'm not talking about those days. I'm talking about those days when they forget you're waiting. I'm 
talking about those days that you order meatloaf and you get fish. I'm talking about those days when the waitress goes out for a smoke break and you're, you're thirsting to death and you need another iced tea. I'm talking about those days when your food comes and it's cold. How do you act then? Do you act like a Christian? Or do you act like, well, I'm paying for it. Then let me give you some advice. Stay home. Because I've been eating out a lot. And nobody's perfect. And then people behind the grill, they got problems like you do. And that poor waitress who worked for a quarter an hour, she doesn't have to put up with your gut. But she does. That guy that's driving slow in front of you, man, he's on an important call. Give him a break. <laughs> what do we do? When a Christian dies, they go to heaven. John 14, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare, prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Amen. Man! Thank God that he cares that much. So, so the Christian life is more than that. Yes, I'm going to heaven. Thank God he died for me. But there has to be something that sets Christian people apart from those that aren't Christians. There has to be something that they can't do. There has to be a power that they lack. There has to be something that makes them so empty that they see it in us and like salt we make them thirsty it's the way we treat other people that treat us bad it's the way they doctors are the biggest liars there are you get a 130 appointment you wait in the waiting room for 45 minutes the doctor will see you now. No, he won't. <laughs> They'll put you in another room. You know what she says to you? Another lie. The doctor will be right with you. I always go to the doctor with a stack of books. And I walk in, and they always look funny. But they never say, what are the books for? Everybody, I take my Bible. I take something to write. Why? So I'm always waiting. And I don't know how you do waiting, but I'd rather have both legs amputated <laughs> than wait. There's something about sitting there. I went to see John Sheets the other day, and I admired him because he's laying there with oxygen, and I said, John, I couldn't do this. I couldn't just be laying in this bed doing nothing. He was probably very busy, probably solving the world's problems. And, but I couldn't just wait. I'm not. And so God, <laughs> once in a while, God will send me one. When you're at the store, that little short line, I jump in that little short line. And all those people that were 27 people back are waving as they go out the door. I'm still waiting. <laughs> what do we do? Three things. Number one, let's shoot through these real quick. In order to put up with bad treatment, in order to get through this world, when those that whether you deserve it or not, whether you think they should, when they treat you bad, you got to deal with it. You deal with it this way, number one. He tells us, number one, verse 14, we're supposed to bless them. Number one, bless them. Bless comes from the word. We get our word, eulogize. 
eulogy. I saw my cousin a couple weeks ago. Let me tell you this story. When I played music, my whole life was music. I didn't have a girlfriend. Amy came along and messed everything up. When I played music, it was all about music. I love music. We practiced all the time. We practiced hard. We practiced long. We practiced over and over. And, and for five years, for five years, I can count two weekends that I did not play somewhere. We practiced, we played. We weren't just a rock band. We played everything. We played at bar mitzvahs. We played for the openings of new buildings. We played at movie theaters before movies. We played for weddings. We played in nightclubs. We, we played at anniversary parties. We played at golf courses. We played at, at, at part. We played everywhere. We played everything. And any you take this how you want. Any idiot can get up and rang, 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 and play rock and roll. But when you learn to play waltzes, when you learn to play all these slow, difficult songs, we practice all the time. I saw my cousin who was the leader of the band. I grabbed him. I said, hey, there's something I need to tell you before you die. And he goes, am I dying? <laughs> He's five years older than me. I said, probably. I said, but let me please tell you something before you die, because I want you to hear this, because I'm saying this at your funeral, but I decided you need to hear it before you die. He said, what is it? I said, thank you for making us practice so hard when we were playing together in the band. I said, you helped me with some character issues. You helped me with some discipline that I'm enjoying the fruit of now in my life. Now I understand. I said, you were like an old man. I was 12. You were 17. I thought you were 89, yelling at us, telling us we're going to, man, I wanted to go out and party. I wanted to have a fun. I wanted to, you know, goof off. But we had to practice. I said, thank you for that. He looked at me. He said, wow, I don't know what to say. I said, you don't have to say anything. I just wanted you to know that I'm thankful that you gave me something in my life that has helped me, even and hopefully until I die. When you eulogize someone, in 35 years, I've had a couple bad funerals. I had that one where that ex-wife snuck in from the side pushed me to the side and began to curse her ex-husband at the funeral service. If I'd gone through that every so often, I wouldn't know what to do, but I kind of sat there like. <laughs> and finally, the funeral directors came in and helped her out. <laughs> she wasn't eulogizing. She was avenging. He was a plague and he couldn't revive. I'll take he he, he I, and I thought, man, I've been to a lot of funerals. And we all were so shocked that she went off for a while. Until somebody figured out, hey, this is not good. <laughs> and so they kind of walked in and escorted, and she's still mouthing off as they were pulling her out of there. Man, I don't want to live a life that somebody wants to curse me. When I'm dead, listen to me. When, when someone does you wrong, you speak well of them. That's what eulogize means. You say, well, you know what? They don't deserve it. It's not, listen, Jesus died for you when you didn't deserve it. Don't, don't try to tell God about what other people deserve. Because God died for you when you deserve the hottest hell. They'll always be. Some of you are as sweet as pie. Some of you make my teeth hurt when you talk. You're so sweet. But there'll always be someone who doesn't like the way you act. There'll always be someone who doesn't like the way you live. There'll always be someone that doesn't like the way you believe. When people hurt you, bless them. 
Say, well, I think I'm going to fail at this. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. But you keep doing it. You keep doing it. You keep deciding that you're going to let God to be the one that has the authority to send someone to hell. That's what curse means in verse 14. You can't send someone to hell. God's the only one that has that authority. And you and I need to know that. My, my, I don't know what's going on. I've never heard someone sneeze more than my wife. She'll wake up, and I think she's kidding. So I'm trying to do the proper thing. If I'm in the other room or downstairs, I can hear her. She'll go, I bless you. And she'll go 37 times, and I'm let, she'll go, you can stop. <laughs> I don't want to stop blessing her. So very soon, yeah. Hey, I'll go bless you. But you know what? I don't mean it. I just want her to stop. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want there to be something wrong. But I know that she's been doing it every morning, so I know that she doesn't have a sneezing disease. There's just something, maybe she's allergic to me. And so, man, she kicks into this tirade of sneezes. And it's hard for me just to sit there when she's out chewing. And I'm not saying. So I say, bless you. should let another one rip. And I don't know how bad they are. Mine are bad. I'll bless you. Bless you. I'm not talking, listen, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about when someone says something ugly about you. You say something good about them. That's tough. I'm in a store and someone sneezes, right? I bless, bless you. They'll go, thank you. Then how do I say, I don't mean it. I mean, what am I blessing? If I really wanted to bless them, I'd give them a track, tell them how to get to heaven. Huh? They sneeze. So we think we're super spiritual because we say, bless you. And we should say, God bless you, but we shorthand it and say, bless. We make it, it's two syllables, bless you, we make it one. Bless. <laughs> it should be, God bless you. But we don't do that. Human nature is not an eye for an eye. Let me tell you current human nature. Current human nature is if you poke out my eye, I'm going to poke out both your eyes and make you eat them. <laughs> That's the way we live. Road rage. When I was a kid in the Studebaker, I was so excited the other day we were driving down the road, I saw a Studebaker Lark wagon like I grew up with. Rode in the back of them. Remember the window would come up? I'd hang out in the back like a dog. I can remember riding that. When, it, when I was a kid, they said, we didn't have road rage. You just passed them. You know, you didn't throw things at them. You didn't pull out a gun. Think of what we've come to. We don't bless anymore. Is there somebody that hates you? Do good to them. Is there somebody that curses you? Bless them. Has someone mistreated you? Pray for them. But our old man, our human nature says, I'm going to pay you back with interest. Whatever you did to me, I'm going to do more to you. That's not blessing. The Bible says, verse 14, bless them which persecute you. And by the way, it doesn't say it like verse 18 does, if it be possible. Number two, say, I can't handle number one. Yeah, it's going to get worse. Number two, you're supposed to bless them. Number two, you're supposed to know them. He says, if they rejoice, rejoice, verse 15. If they weep, weep. The only way you can do that is if you know them. We don't know anybody anymore. You know why we do the fellowship song? Watch me now. Watch me now. This is not the fellowship song. And then you say to me, 
hey, what's that guy's name, the tall, handsome guy with all the hair? I go, Ken Kaufman. <laughs> hey, 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 hey. That, that's not knowing someone. Some of you don't like it when I talk about people or ask about things. I'm trying to know. <laughs> I, I don't want to go through life, hey, hey, some shame on some of you that you don't know everybody's name. Who's that one guy sits up there, the loud guy? Doug? Yeah, him. Well, how come you don't know his name? We're afraid of him. He won't bark at you. Just say, hey, you know, and the way to start that is you go, hi, I'm Vito. Hi, Vito. I'm Jason. Normal people. <laughs> we should know each other. When I pray for you, I know you. I want to know what's going on. If I go by, there, there are places I go by that trigger. Places you used to work that still trigger a memory of you. Why? Because I know you. I can't go to St. Joe Hospital without thinking about you. I, just because even though you're not there anymore, you were there. So that connection comes up. I, I want to know that. We need to know each other. Wednesday night, I shared. You asked, what, what kind of prayer? What do you need? Here's what I need. I need our church to take God more seriously. I said that Wednesday night. We need to be serious about coming, showing up, paying attention, being in here, being a part. That, that to me, is very important. Say, well, you, you having problems? All kinds. But I don't spend my time. I already know me. I, I'm talking about you and I knowing each other. Me and chocolate get a, along very well. Let me, let me tell you this story. This is bad. Some of you don't know this, but I'm about to let the cat out of there. I have been wearing invisible braces. I have to wear them 22 hours a day. I hate it. I'm an old man. I don't care if I die with crooked teeth. <laughs> so I went into this invisible Invisalign, and I hate it. I absolutely, I can't talk. I don't have them in now. You say, we wish you did. It'd be a lot shorter. <laughs> Every time you take these out, you have to brush and floss and put them back in. And I'm going on my third month, and every time I eat, I have the counter full of chocolate-covered Twinkies and chocolate cake Twinkies. And there's a couple of pumpkin muffins sitting there and cookies and chip. I mean, it's awful. But now when I eat, it's like it's my last meal. <laughs> I pull those dumb Invisaligners out. I head to the kitchen. And I'm like one of those birds that swoop down to eat that squirrel that's dead in the road. <laughs> I don't need a lot of it. And Amy, she'll see me. I'll be at the counter, and I'll just be trying to decide what should I eat, what can I eat, because I'm not, I can't do this all day. So I leave them in all day. When a meal comes up, I pull them out, I brush my teeth. After I'm done, put them back in. But if I'm home, if I'm out, I'll go, I need a cookie. we got to find a cookie. <laughs> and she'll go, you are so pitiful. <laughs> And I'll go, you knew this 40 years ago. She said, man, I never thought you'd do this. I said, I don't need to eat a lot. 
but I need to eat what I want. Be sensitive about the feelings of others. Hey, I'll have three of those and be happy. But I'll be happy. Be, be, when someone rejoices, watch now, watch. When someone rejoices, human nature says, I resent that. Because you have something that I don't, and I'm jealous. Man, we, we need to ditch that. Amen. We need to just ditch that. Sometimes it's hard to rejoice over somebody else's victories. But when you know someone well enough, verse 15, that you can weep with them, you know them. We ought to be weeping with each other. We ought to be close enough to each other that when they rejoice, we know about it. When they're hurting, we know about it. Psalm 56 and verse 8. Psalm 56 and verse 8 says, Thou tellest my wanderings. God knows when you get away. The psalmist says, Thou tellest my wanderings. And then he says, Put thou my tears into thy bottle. And then he adds, are they not in thy book? God keeps track of every tear that you shed. You know why? Because he knows you and wants to know you. And he puts your tears in a bottle and he treasures them. Let me share. I hope I shared this story before. Let me share it again. In Bible times, when a family entered the temple, you actually went in one door, and they had, like many places do now, an entry door and an exit door. In the temple in Jerusalem, they had a door that you entered the temple, and you had a door that you exited the temple. Whenever a family lost a loved one, whenever a family in Bible times went through sorrow, they were told, to go in the out and out the in. Say, well, why did they tell them to do that? So all the people that were coming in, as that family going through sorrow was going out, so all the people that were coming in could see the sorrow and share it with them and know it. And when everybody that was coming out of the temple saw that family coming into the temple, they could see their face. They could confront them and see their face. How many times have we come to church and we really don't look at each other? Ha, 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 ha. We don't even say words. How you doing? Uh. How's everything? Uh. How do you spell that? Everything going okay? Uh. Hope to see you again. Uh. We pass by them. We're not even aware of what they're going through. I always try to tell Amy when someone treats us bad, they must be going through something that we have no idea. Somebody's not mean to you to be mean to you. Often they're mean to you because something's happening in their life they can't handle. And they need us to know that. They don't need us to curse them. They don't need us to yell at them. They don't need us to, I'm so offended. The disciples said, hey, we don't want to be offended. Jesus said, man, you guys are in big trouble, Luke 17. He said, because offenses are going to come. And we need to deal with it. Jesus is at the tomb of Lazarus. Lazarus has died. Jesus said he'd be there. He shows up late. Lazarus dies. He looks at Martha. She's crying. Martha looks at Mary. She's weeping. What did Jesus do? He wept. Come on, you've memorized this. John eleven thirty five. 35. Jesus wept. It's a whole verse. 
The whole verse. Jesus gets to the tomb of Lazarus. They hire people to cry. He knows what's happened. He knows why it's happened. He knows that he'll raise Lazarus from the dead. He sees Martha bawling her eyes out. She's lost her brother. Martha looks at Mary. Mary's lost her brother. Jesus sees both of them weeping. He knows they mean it. He sees a crowd hired to weep. Friends weeping, but he sees Martha and Mary. And Jesus begins to cry. If we aren't on guard, the devil will do all he can to drive a wedge between us. He's not going to bring in someone from the outside to hurt this church. He'll do the best thing that he can do. He'll hurt us from within. We'll stop caring about each other. We'll treat each other like, oh yeah, that one guy. People say to me, you know that one guy? You know that one guy? And I'll go, if you tell me his name, I'll know. You know, he sits right there all the time. And then, of course, it comes to me, because most of you do. What are you going to do when you get to heaven? You're just going to stay in one place. We have to sacrifice our desire to always be right so we can live in peace with other people. Bless them, know them, number three. Short, little, simple, number three. Verse 16, he says, Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceit. You know what that means? See them. See them. Get, get down to where they look them in the eye. He says in verse 16, he says, but condescend. When someone's low, when someone's depressed, get down to where you can see them. Well, here's what we do. What are you depressed about? Isn't God bigger than that? We'll remember that when you go through it. You know what I don't want to be? You know one of the things I really, you might call them Pharisees, I call them spiritual snobs. Too important, too spiritual. God is the biggest thing in their life. But boy, they don't know how to minister to someone that's going through a hard time. And face it, we all have or will go through a hard time. And what we need is someone who get down and see us. We, we look from up here. Hey, what are you doing? But he says, get down there where they are. He's telling us we shouldn't say I'm better than somebody else. And there are certain people that don't belong in my church. There's only one kind of person that's welcome in our church. I want you to know this. We only accept one kind of person. you got to be a sinner. Amen. We don't want no spiritual snob. Go somewhere else. Start your own church. I like dealing with sinners. I like help. It's easy. When they say, oh, I've fallen, I don't say, I would never do that. If I have, I can say, I've done that. Let me tell you what I did. Or I could point to someone else and say, you know what? They've been through what you've been through. Amen. Why? Because we're sinners. Some are saved sinners. Some are going to be saved sinners. All we take is sinners. If you've already been saved, you're welcome. If you're not saved yet, you're still a sinner. You're welcome. Because we all need the mercy and forgiveness of God. Amen. Too many of us are self-centered. True humility is when you don't look at yourself too seriously, but you laugh at yourself. Some of you need to do that. You think you're so perfect and your face cracks when you laugh at yourself. You know you're a sinner and you know you make mistakes and you know that you fail and you know that you're not perfect. But Jesus still loves you. And Paul doesn't let us off the hook because he closes his chapter and he says, be not, in other words, you don't have to be overcome with evil. But he said, you have something in you not only to bless 
your enemies, not only to bless those that persecute you, not only to know those that are hurting, not only to see those that are down, but he said, you have something in you, verse 21, where you can overcome evil with good. Hey, hey, you know it. If we had more Christians in this world that did that, we'd be winning a lot more people to Christ. If we had more Christians that acted like Christians, listen, I can only be who I am. I can't be somebody else. Jesus came, he taught it, he lived it, he loved his enemies. He showed kindness to all people. Jesus spent time, you're not going to like this, but let's just get the truth out. Jesus spent time with prostitutes. Jesus spent time with drunkards. Jesus spent time with crooks. In fact, some of them he called to be his disciples. The only people that Jesus had trouble with were the snobs, the Pharisees. The religious people, they thought they were better than everybody else. But the common people flocked to him because he accepted them. Are you treating other people right? Are you treating the people that treat you wrong? Are you treating them right? Here's, here's, you want the bad news? Here's the bad news. I'm done. That's not the bad news. That's the good news. Here's the bad news. Now that you've heard this, God's going to test you. So I would do a couple of things. I wouldn't go out to lunch. I'd go straight home. I'd lock myself in the closet. <laughs> I'd turn my phone off. And I would just pray that God would give me strength to handle whatever comes. Because I know if it doesn't happen to you, it's going to happen to me. Amy will say to me, what would you preach on today? You know what I'll say to her? Buckle in. <laughs> Buckle up. It's coming. She'll go, oh, no. You talked about the devil, didn't you? Well, we tried to. I'll say, no, I talked about people, you know, cursing us and making us what we will. Oh, she'll go, oh, no. <laughs> hey, doesn't happen to you. I know it's going to happen to me. See why I didn't want to preach this? Pray with me, your head bowed, your eyes closed, every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, it's no good if we come to church, read the Bible, and then leave these walls and go out into a world that needs you so desperately. It will do them no good if we don't act like Christ. So may you help us, help me. Others are going to have to pray for themselves. I'll do what I can for them, but right now, I, I just, I need you. Help me to be like Christ, no matter how someone treats me. Lord, if there's anybody here that's never asked you to be their Savior, if they sit here today and they've never trusted Christ, if they don't know 100% certain that they'd go to heaven, right now, that's their biggest problem. Please show them that Jesus is the only way. He's not one of the ways. He's the only way. Please show them, dear Lord, that nobody can get to God except through Jesus. So Jesus came. He died on the cross. He went to the grave. And after three days, he rose from the dead. And the Bible says that we have to believe that he did that for us. That we can't do a thing about it. But if we believe Jesus did it for us, then we can accept him. We can trust him to be our savior. We trust him to be the one that will get us to heaven because we believe that what he did was good enough for God. But there's none good. There's nothing we can do. Lord, if there's anybody here today that's not saved, please, please speak to them. And for the rest of us, Lord, for the rest of us who deal with bad situations, for those of us who deal with being hurt by words said or deeds done. Oh, dear Lord, please help us to handle it like Jesus. Help us to bless people. Help us to know people. Help us to see people. Your head bowed, your eyes closed. We'll do this quickly. Your head bowed, your eyes closed. Preacher, there's something in my life God's speaking to me about. There's something I need to take care of.
something, something, something I, I want to take care of before I leave today. Let's make it specific. Preacher, I want to be like Jesus no matter how people treat me, no matter what I go through. I want to be there for people. I want to help people. I want to know people. I want to bless them. I want to see them. Preacher, God speak to my heart. God speak to my heart. Here's my hand. Here's my hand. Here's my hand. Up and down. Up and down. Preacher, God speak to my heart. Up and down. Up and down. Up and down. God speak to my heart. If you're here today and you're not sure you're going to heaven, please let us show you what the Bible says. Please, please come to me. Please let us show you how, how you can know and if you're a Christian and you leave here and you're struggling with something, please, please take care of it before you leave. Dear Father, may your spirit convict us. We ought to be deciding. We ought to know what's right. We ought not need the spirit of God to show us our sin. It's so ugly and so uh, counter to what you are. We, we should be dealing with it. But please. Convict us now so that we make the decision that we need to make so that we can act like Jesus. I pray this in Jesus' name. Piano's going to play. She, she's playing. You're standing. As you stand, if there's a decision you want to make, you come as you stand. You come as she plays. If you want to talk to God, if you want to leave here and go, you know what? I need to make sure I handle life like Jesus would. I want to make sure when people are mean to me, when they hurt me, when they cuss at me, when they treat me bad, I want to make sure I treat them right. He said, you don't have to be overcome with evil, but you can overcome evil with good. It's in you. You have the capacity to do the right thing. You have the capacity to live how you're supposed to live. She's playing. God speak to your heart. What are you going to do about those people that you might consider your enemy? What are you going to do about them? Bible says, feed them if they're hungry. Give them water if they're thirsty. Do what Jesus would do. Vengeance is not yours. That's God's. Vengeance is not yours. She's going to play it through one more time. If you need to come and have it, you come on. You come on. If you're praying, thank you. If you need to come, come on. Pray with me. Dear Father, help me to be sensitive to those that rejoice and rejoice with them. That shouldn't be hard to do. But how often I've said, hey, I want to be the one rejoicing. I want somebody to rejoice with me. Help me to rejoice with others. And Lord, help me to be sensitive when someone weeps, when they're sad, when they're going through sorrow. Help me to see that. Often we just avoid it because we don't want it to be a part of our life. Help me to be there for those who sorrow. Now, Lord, I know. I know you're going to test me. And I want to pass. And so I'm calling upon the supernatural ability of the Holy Spirit that lives in me to give me the strength, to give me the power to be like Jesus. The Bible says we should walk in his steps. We should do as he, he said, do as I've done unto you. Help, help us, Lord, please. I pray this. In Jesus' name, amen.